invite all the speakers of the second segment of the session to take their places uh, on stage. And let me proceed with the first speaker, Professor Robert Nikmatulin from the uh, Russian Academy of Sciences, who is going to share with us on the experiences of uh, the Russian Academy of Sciences in uh, international issues. I won't even attempt to tell you how much time you need. Uh, yeah, no problem. Thank you. We have the floor, sir. OK, thank you. Dear Chairman, I was asked to present a talk. How to? to present a talk about the bridges between the National Academy of Sciences and uh, the, with the scientists of Islamic world. Be honest, I am not fond, I'm not fond of talking in general words about the science, especially my American and European colleagues said a lot about the justice words about the science. And I decided to talk about Russian Academy of Science at first, and then to present some points, ideas, on the global crisis, which excite all the scientists, and maybe some of politicians. Russian Academy of Science was found 1725, it's National Academy, Federal Academy, it's self-governed academy. During all the time, Russian Academy managed to conserve democratical points. Even during Stalin time, all the people in Russian Academy, president, vice president, director of the institutes, they were elected by their colleagues. It is interesting that at the year of founding of Russian Academy, 1725. My grand-grand-grandfathers were stripped by Peter the Great of the noble titles because they rejected proposition to be Christianized. And it is interesting that 280 years later, I was elected to the Academy which was found by Peter the Great. It has two functions. The first function, fellowship. Russian Academy elects four, has 400 academicians and 700 corresponding members. And all the most important uh, problems are solved in the general session of our Academy. And we gather two times a year. And here, there are two academicians. Academician Akaev, who is a was elected as a foreign member, and me. The second uh, point, or the second function of our academy, it's Ministry of Fundamental Science. It's very unusual for European countries, for America. But anyway, it's some of our traditions, and I think it's not the worst tradition of Russia. And this function is realized by uh, uh, branches. It's shown here this uh, scientific branches, mathematics, physics, and so and so and so on, you can read it, and as natural science and humanitarian science branches. And all academicians and corresponding member, they are distributed in these branches, and we gather two times a year discussing, appointing the people, discussing the most important scientific uh, problem. Calling. 350 research institutes. They are named as academical institutes. They are their function to make fundamental or academical research in all these sciences. And it's around 100,000 people. All, they are distributed in all regions of our huge country. And we have PhD students too. It's about 4,000 PhD students. We name them aspirants. Federal budget of the academy, it's federal budget, it's from the federal budget, it's $2 billion, roughly. 
and uh, by contracts, additional contracts with the government, with the commercial companies, we have 1.6. By my estimation and estimation by my colleagues, it's not more than 50% that it is necessary to have the normal uh, research activity for our people. Unfortunately, the modern leaders of Russia, in spite of their declared democracy and so and so on, they are not so cruel like Stalin, but anyway, they don't understand properly all the necessity. Normally, I think it's all the, in all the world, politicians, they know all the problems themselves, and usually they don't need our opinion. And then I'd like to say a few, it's a list of some of the global crises, but I will talk only about the three of them. Climate, global change, it's my professional, because I'm a director of, of Institute of uh, Oceanology. Then I will, as a mathematician, I will say a few words about the economical crisis because I am involved in some theory, or economical theory. And then, it's some of my points on the crisis of the European democracy. And all these problems was said in the session, and even crisis of European democracy was uh, told by Prince Royal, His Highness, uh, Royal Prince uh, uh, El Hassan. Climate warming, what does it mean? It means that the average temperature at the surface of the Earth uh, is increasing, slowly increasing, because it's average on all the surface of the world. It's increasing 1.75 centigrees during the last 100 years, but it's accelerating, because uh, that during the last 60 years we have one centigree growth. Then we have the rise of the civil level, three millimeter per year during the last 10, 15 years. Then we have decrease of the Arctic Ocean surface covered by the ice in summertime during the last 30 years. It's very strong impact. Sometimes the people says one centigree, it's not so important. It's not important physically. It's negligible for physics, but for biology system, it's very important. If your temperature 36.6, you are normal. If the temperature 37.6, you are ill. The same for all biology system. It's very important and it may influence on the bacterial uh, evolution, on the virus evolution and so on. And then the people uh, connect all this increasing by the increasing of the concentration of carbon dioxide. You see this increase of carbon dioxide concentration is pretty large. It's very, and not all the people agree that the carbon dioxide is guilty for warming. But uh, majority of young people, they are sure that it, and I will show you a few arguments uh, uh, on, on the carbon dioxide. Greenhouse effect, greenhouse effect, does it exist or not? The people who says not, they say, here it is shown the sea level evolution during the last 140,000 years. And it is interesting that the last 20, 10,000 years only, when the people lived, the increase of the sea level was 10 millimeter per year. And now only three millimeter per year. But at that time, it was not a drama, because at that time, we, not, we didn't live. It's, it was not a drama for us, but it was, it was not drama for people at that time, because at that time, they didn't have any on the shore huge building, they may easily to change the place of, the, of their life. But even more, 50, 70 million years ago, CO2 concentration will two times higher than now. It's natural process. And the temperature in the world, even at the bottom of the ocean, was about 10 centigrees. Now around zero. It's huge. Warming compared to the 50, 70, uh, uh, it was very warm 50, 70 years ago. It's not comparable with now. But if we consider the CO2 concentration during the last 700 years, we see that the concentration of carbon dioxide is changed with a period about 50,000 years ago, 50,000 years. And, you see, and now all the people, humanity, civilizations, it, it puts on the one thickness on one line. And we consider it's more, pardon? 
It was at the beginning of the 20th century. Then it was the middle of the century. Then this year, 2007, I begin my activity at the Oceanology Institute. And three years later, 210. Like an like a explosion, increase of the carbon dioxide. And during these only three years, the quantity of the carbon dioxide increased on 20 uh, billion tons. Every year, the people emanates by burning the combustions, due to combustions, about 10 billion tons of carbon by carbon dioxide. And practically it means that all the carbon dioxide which we emanate now by indus in an industrial equipment, now it cannot be absorbed by the natural resources. But all carbon, di carbon in the atmosphere in the form of uh, carbon dioxide is 500 billion ton. It means that during uh, 10 years, maybe 30 years, we increase the carbon dioxide, maybe, maybe, on 200,000 tons. It's, it's dramatical, by the way. And now, uh, at, all the time, we had some disbalances. Absorption of carbon dioxide and emanation of carbon dioxide by the natural uh, resource, by greenhouse, by soil, and by other uh, <coughs> biological system and uh, bi biological system. But now, and this balance was about tenth of uh, giga uh, billion ton per year. And now we have disbalance, industrial disbalance, ten, hundred times more. And it means now anthropogenic emanation and disbalance of carbon to the atmosphere, many times higher than natural disbalances. And it's very dramatical. And of course, due to the mass of ocean and uh, heat capacity of the ocean much higher than the uh, heat capacity of atmosphere and mass of carbon dioxide in the ocean water dissolved in, in water 50 times higher than uh, carbon dioxide in atmosphere, it means the key problem of the warming climate is on the ocean. Ocean is a dictator for the climate. And of course it's the problem for, 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 for the investigation of the ocean current and, uh, and ocean current is very complicated, it's three-dimensional because at the surface it's one direction, or the bottom it's another, and all these processes are very important for formulation of uh, uh, climate. And the most important things is the capacity of biological system, I mean the green substance, phytoplankton, and uh, green uh, mass of the, uh, the earth to absorb all this carbon dioxide. And now the science and the biology of the ocean cannot answer. What's the real production of the green mass in the ocean? And what's the capacity of all this green mass in the ocean and in the earth to absorb the carbon dioxide? It's a problem. And this is a, one of the key problems to predict the, the climate. And in spite, there is not a lot of unknown things. Experimental, and I will say not only experimental, even theoretical. Not, it's not known now. Anyway, the people is making the calculation and there is the program IPCC, Intergovernmental Program of, 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 of Climate Change, which is headed by the former Vice President Al Gore. And some of the Russian scientists took part on this activity of this uh, foundation. And this foundation was awarded by the Nobel Prize, 50% for Al Gore, 50% for, for this agency, Intergovernmental. And they make this calculation, and you see here the prediction for the uh, 30 years or maybe 20 years earlier, you see that they will increase the middle uh, average temperature at the high latitudes, but to the end of the century, it's increased about seven and five centigrees. It's very intensive and the, the most important that not only the temperature, but on the, even the precipitation is changed, should be changed. And dramatically by calculation, I repeat one more, it's calculation only, prediction, it's not reliable, of course, but anyway, it's, it, we don't have any other predictions, but where the, we have the deficit of the precipitation, the deficit will be stronger. When we have the, uh, too much precipitation to stroke, we will increase the stronger. It means the uh, 
it's, it's, it's harder for the new. What's the problem for calculation? At first, the problem is the node size for numerical simulation for partial differential equation too large because of the even supercomputer is not uh, enough to do it because the mesoscale uh, of in the ocean of the currencies which intensifies the heat exchange air carbon dioxide exchange with the water in atmosphere a two phase prob problem uh, it's around 10 20 kilometers it means the size of the nodes in horizontal line should be about one kilometer and, uh, and the vertical size should be thinner much more and it needs 10 trillion of nodes practically it's fantastic for the modern uh, ca ca for modern uh, ca computers but the most important problem is theoretical problem that we when we are considering the fast every day we have the change of the temperature every season we have this change of the temperature which has the scale around 10 centigrade 40 centigrade but we want to calculate slow increase of the average temperature and to do it by calculating but with the step 15 minutes it means you accumulate a lot of errors. It, mean, it, makes, it needs to make some mathematical progress to, do, uh, to, do, uh, to make this calculation. And then I'd like to say it means if the mankind is guilty for, for warming, global warming, it means we should minimize the industrial energy consumption. And what consumption we do we have? United States, almost 10. Uh, conventional, it's uh, equivalent of oil, conventional uh, ton per year. Europe, two, th two times less. Russia, three. But at the Soviet time, it was five. Why it is, we shortened the consumption? Because in Russia, unfortunately, all the plant practically stopped. Uh, because in Russia has the power marketing dogmatics. This is a problem for our country. And these dogmatics, they destroy the industry. It means, now I understand, that democracy is very important, freedom is very important, but there are more important things like a productive capacity of the society. In the first place, if, you, if it's low, it means that all other democracy has not any. China, now China, we have two Chinas. The first China, the first part, about 600 million people, who works in the plants. They are involved in the industrial activity. China burns three billion tons of coal only. And during the last five, 10 years, it's in dramatically increased the uh, coal consumption and other uh, energy resources. But there is another part of China, 50% of China, which is uses only muscle energy and the energy of the animals, nothing else. And, and they will increase the number Oh, okay. Oh, the most important thing that the 30% of the world population now consumes 90% of energy. It means if the European country talking about minimizing of energy consumption, it means they should show the example because the developing country will increase the energy consumption. Okay. But uh, there is some positive side. Today we discussed uh, the one of the section about the nuclear engineering. It's one of the important things that only nuclear engineer may supply the energy for the former a few thousand years. Only using the closed cycle of uranium, uranium utilizing uh, spent fuel and so. But nuclear energy is very dangerous and some, now people don't want to have it. And finally, I'd like to say that the, usually there is famous Russian writer who said that the climate in Russia then good when the government. I say the climate in the world then good when the peoples and their government correspond. And the last idea about economical crisis. Economical crisis. Unfortunately, by my opinion, the people who is involved in economical science uh, and politicians, they forgot about the, the most solid theorems. The reason of all global economical crisis, only one reason, that the rich people, the rich class, takes the enormous disbalance fraction of the income of the country. 
and for other people, they don't have enough money to buy the all produce, pro production produce. In Russia, in Russia, unfortunately, the most extremistic case that illegally the last percent, the richest percent of Russian populations attracts for themselves the same now illegally, uh, the same quantity of money which is legally absorbed by all other people. And this is press our economy and has no any possibility to increase it. The theorem one, only single engine of the marketing economics is demand, purchasing capacity, as yesterday said uh, ex-Prime Minister of Malaysia. Only one engine. Nobody in the West and in Russia discussed this problem. If you want to prevail the economical crisis, it means you should take some part of the income of rich people by taxes and give it to the middle class. Only one method to, to improve the situation with the economics. The second theorem, principal investor of the economics is a people which has balanced salary. This uh, theorem number two is forgotten, unfortunately, by politicians and by the people who is studying economics. Oh, and I'm finishing, and only I say that mass media and movie actors impacts on the public opinion much stronger than the science impacts. It's a problem, not only for Russia. For Russia, it's a very strong problem. Now, practically, Russian leaders but I think in European leaders, they are more actors than the political real strategist. It's, and that's why I'm, I'm saying that the direct elections became direct elections of the presidents, direct elections of the deputies of the parliaments. I was a member of Russian parliament, I know the system of election. Became non-effective method for selecting of the governmental leaders. This is the very nice words of the Leo Tolstoy. Everything may be excused, but not the perversion of the highest truth which were achieved by the humanity with a lot of efforts. Now we have the, this situation, that the uh, highest truths, they are not understood, understood the people. And finally, long live Islamic Academy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nigmatulin, for your very passionate uh, presentation. Let me very quickly now move on to the next speaker, uh, Professor Bekiraj, Be President of the Academy of Sciences of Albania. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Honorable Chairs of Session, dear colleagues, dear friends, First of all, I want to thank organizer to invite me in this conference. Really, I am happy to be here. But I have a uh, coincidence for me because uh, one week before, in my country, arrived for the first time Prime Minister of Qatar. This was really a very big event in my country. But uh, I am the first Albanian that's come here after this visit. That means that uh, I am the first, and after me, after science, will come business, ministers, or other peoples. This is a beautiful thing for me. In performing its mission, the Academy of Science of Albania has aimed at carrying out its functions. Establishing an appropriate infrastructure according to the standards and in line with the academy structure after its reforming three years before for the development of an efficient activity in conformity with academy functions and for the fulfillment of its mission. Other, collaboration with government institutions to identify subjects where the academy must be engaged for the realization of government objectives, providing necessary expertise and suggestions to the police-making and decision-making institutions, 
Cooperation with research and educational institutions in Albania and abroad to carry out studies in different fields of science and technology. Proposing new fields of study and research in conformity with the demands of social and economic development of the country. Publishing periodicals and other of prints of high scientific level. Organizing scientific conferences and congress at national and international level. Organizing competitions for awarding scientific prizes. Promoting and supporting of excellence for young researchers in science and national level in order to reach high research standards to establish and sustain its representing structures. In this context, we have organized in this year some conferences in collaboration with university, some ministry, and business. For example, we have organized a conference for economy where we invite some professor from our university and from university of other countries to explain really how it's necessary to make all the things in our country. Other conference we have organized together with Academy of Science of Montenegro. And we have uh, followed this road to involve in these conferences and our leaders of politics and government. For example, in this conference with Academy of Science of Montenegro, we had and two presidents of republics because we have organized this conference for a lake of Skodra is a lake that's part for two countries. And this lake has much problems. And in this manner, we have continued, and in this month, for example, we have organized two conferences, international conferences, one for uh, me medicine and the other for biotechnology. Now, in the uh, first and second November, we are organizing together with the Academy of Science of Sweden a, a conference, international conference for forestry. Attention has been paid to the analysis of European Union with regard to the developments of science and technology in the Western, Western Balkans and the research situation in Albania and in the region, and to the intensification of efforts for eliminate, eliminating the disadvantages in science and technology as prevailing, preva prevailing of public sector against private sector in science and technology, like of integration between the agents of research and other police, lack of funds, insufficient development of the private sector in science and technology and lack of marketing, marketing of science and technology achievements, lack of incentives for the increase of international cooperation, insufficient development and implementation of legal framework and strategies in science and technology. In setting these properties, the Academy of Science has taken into consideration the national strategy for research and development and technological innovation and the government strategies, recommendations of ALEA, IAP, ICSU, UNESCO, and of other international institutions and the economic development of the country and its reality and prospects. In the analysis presented on the Academy activity during 2010, we tried to bring an analytical report. To be analytic means to fix <coughs> uh, meticulous indicators, measurable and comparable ones in order to perceive the development realistic and with dynamism. <coughs> Excuse me. The dynamic developments of the activity have been referred the comparison of indicators with those of the previous years. In our analysis, we have in defined and analyzed the international criteria and indicators defined in the Frescati handbook. Here I want to emphasize the help of AIP in the period of restructure of our academy three years before. Professor Mohamed Hassan has played a very good role to give health to our academy. He is always concretely and effectively. 
I want to think, to, uh, to say that the necessity of defining this, all the qualitative and quantitative indicators in, Alba in our, our Academy of Science in Albania, as the elite in, of institutions in research, development and innovation, derives from the role that its research and development outcome must play in the social and economic development of the country. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Becky Raj, for an insight of the Acad Academy of Sciences of Albania. Let me now move on to the next speaker, uh, Dr. Samsudin Tugiman, Secretary General of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, who's going to speak on building bridges between the Islamic world and the West, some approaches of the ASM and ISTI. Uh, you have the floor, sir. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and a very good uh, evening. Uh, my presentation today will take you through uh, what the Academy of Science has done in terms of uh, some of its program and then reflect upon uh, uh, what kind of program activity that help to uh, bridge between Islamic world and the West. Um, to begin with, I think um, I will just uh, go through the uh, establishment. It was, uh, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established some 16 years ago during the time of uh, the former Prime Minister, uh, Tun Mahathir Mohamad, and this mission is uh, to pursue, encourage, enhance excellence in the fields of science, engineering, and technology for the development of the nation and the benefit of mankind. And its function include uh, the following, as you can see from the slides, development of science, uh, foster science policy, uh, forum, establish maintain relationship between academy and other similar bodies uh, worldwide. And uh, these are the uh, focus uh, area of the activity, we, as I mentioned earlier, on science policy, science excellence program, networking, science engagement, and publication. Now, based on the above uh, mentioned function and program, some of the activities that contribute to the bridging or the divide between the West and the developing or stroke Islamic countries. The programs that the Academy does can be divided into two groups. Firstly, programs that contribute to the narrowing the gap between Malaysia as one of the Islamic country and the West. And the second is narrowing the gap between Islamic countries as a group and the West. And uh, to do this, so what we have done in the past 16 years is we have uh, actually a bilateral agreement between a number of academies in the West, which includes the Royal Society. That is the first academy that we have signed agreement with, Royal Society of Edinburgh, Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, the French Academy of Sciences, and MOUs between uh, Cambridge, Nottingham, Edinburgh, Cardiff, and lately the CERN, which is the uh, European Organization for Nuclear Research. And uh, at the moment, we are also heading the Malaysia's membership in EASA, which is the International Institute of Applied System Analysis. And out of this, um, in, in EASA itself, if you look, there are 18 members at the moment. Only three are from Islamic countries, which includes Malaysia. And uh, we have, uh, from the beginning, uh, the Nobel uh, Laureate Program, and uh, this includes, uh, you know, the Lindau Program, lecture series, attending Nobel Prize ceremonies, and Nobel Prize Centennial Exhibition. We do every year invite uh, several, at least uh, one or two Nobel Laureate to come to Malaysia to, to give other than just seminars or lectures to talk to our students and also to uh, the discuss of having a scientific discourse with our, our scientific uh, with our scientific community. So these are some of the programs that uh, help um, uh, Malaysia to be in contact with uh, those uh, centers of excellence in, 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 the, in the developed countries. And uh, under the um, um, ambit of uh, the bridging the divide between developing and Islamic countries and the West. Uh, Academy is fortunate to host, we are hosting actually two international organizations. One is ICSU, which I think you are aware of. And here we have um, 
We are a member of the ICSU board, and we have out of 25 members, National, Asia, and the Pacific. ICSU has, uh, as you know, 121 national members worldwide, and which details of which you can find in the uh, web page. Now, through this um, hosting of ICSU, ASM provides views of the developing stroke Islamic countries and opportunity for scientists from developing countries to participate in ICSU program activities. And uh, several of them, you know, which I don't need to relate here. The other one is hosting of the International Science, Technology and Innovation Center for South South Cooperation under the auspices of UNESCO, short form of ISTING, in which I am the uh, the director at the moment, and my chairman is at the back there, Dr. Li Yechong. And of course, if uh, in, in terms of academy, you have also Tan Sri Omar here, who, who, who was the founding president of our academy, and several fellows were here, including uh, Professor Dr. Sagri, which is in front of you. So if you need further details on what we do in terms of trying to bridge between the uh, knowledge between the, the, East, uh, the West and the Islamic country, probably they'll be able to, 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 to give a hand as well. Now, uh, we have um, the Academy of Sonoma is now a member of IP. We are in the ESCO, the Executive Committee. And IP, as you know, is an is a academy, uh, uh, academy where we have 100 members, you know, both from developed and developing country. And, uh, the ESCO members, if I'm not mistaken, I think it's 12 of them. Only the Malaysia, this Academy of Science, and Egypt, uh, ESCO members from the Islamic countries. The, the balance is from the developed countries. And IEP, is, as you know, is a global network for science and launched in 1993. And here again, academy can provide views of the developing Islamic countries, an opportunity for scientists from developed countries to participate in any of the IEP programs. At the moment, we are also the co-chair of the Inter-Academy Medical Panel, representing developing countries. And um, it is again, IAMP is a global network for the World Medical Academies and medical section of Academies of Sciences and Engineering committed to improving health worldwide. Again, as I mentioned earlier, Academy of Science Malaysia can provide views for the developing countries and opportunities for scientists from developing countries to participate in the program of the inter-academy panel, inter-academy medical panel. This is the Malaysian Antarctica program in which uh, we have been involved for, uh, I think, about eight years now. We are now a non-consultative member of the Antarctica Treaty System, they call the ATS. And there are 48 members of the ATS, which is consultative and non-consultative, and most of them are from developed countries. Only Turkey and Malaysia are from the Islamic countries. Um, we have signed an uh, agreement uh, on this program with uh, the uh, Australian Antarctica Division, Antarctica New Zealand, Korea Paul Research, and British Antarctica Survey. And, um, since we have this platform under the ATS, uh, it, it can provide the opportunity for developing countries or Islamic countries who wish to undertake research in the Antarctica. Eh, with, uh, you can go through the, the, the platform of Malaysia. So this is something which I think is, is for good for you all to know. And also we can give views from developing countries on the, governing, uh, the governance of the Antarctica itself. Now, we have the journal. This is uh, similarly done by other countries. And we have also uh, launched the Mahade Science Award uh, five years ago. And uh, this is given uh, for scientific work, uh, this outstanding scientific work uh, so in solving problems of the tropics in the area of agriculture, medicine, architecture, engineering, and natural resource management. Again, this program provides opportunity for scientists from the West, from the developing countries, and developed countries uh, to, to, to be um, nominated for this uh, uh, program. And normally when we have this program, the scientists that is being selected will give uh, you know, the usual uh, uh, 
lectures, and then uh, it will be a kind of program we normally do, meeting the students, this, uh, having this scientific discourse with, with the other people. So the sharing of knowledge uh, in this area can, can be shared between develop and developing countries uh, as a whole. Yeah. Now, uh, we have uh, the forum. We, we used to host this forum for interaction through international conferences, seminar, scientific meeting, as has been said earlier by the representative of other academies. We just hosted the 22nd Pacific Congress, which was done in June in Kuala Lumpur, and 1,000 uh, scientists from uh, 37 countries, I think, participated in this program. They are scientists from developed and developing countries. So again, this kind of forum helped to to enhance uh, the gap or narrowing the gap, as, uh, as I said earlier. We have the IMP meeting the, and also the General Assembly. This is on the medical panel, which was done in June, uh, recently in Kuala Lumpur. We also host the Asia Nano Forum. And uh, for next year, we are hoping to hold the biannual conference, which, which is called the Academic Science of Malaysia International Conference. This is some, uh, something where we normally have speakers uh, from, developing, from developed and developing countries to, to share their experiences uh, with us and also with the international participants. So we will send um, the, uh, the scholar to, to all of you, and those who are interested may be able to participate in this important program. Now, just to give you a, a graph, the linkages that we have developed over the years is 18, and out of these, you find that developed countries, there are four. Developed countries, 10. Oh, I think countries, there are four. So basically, it's about 50% from the OIC countries and 50% from developed countries. So I think it's a good balance for, people, for, for, you know, for a country like Malaysia to work with the developed countries. Now, uh, if you take the OIC country, yeah, out of that, you, you have also my ASM multilateral partners. There are 14. OIC countries, there are three. Developed countries, 11. A bit lopsided, but maybe this is, a, this is something uh, quite, uh, you know, we have to look into it. Yeah? But this is the way we have done at the moment. And uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about ISTIC, which is the International Center, Science, Technology, and Innovation Center for South South Cooperation under the auspices of UNESCO. And uh, again, through the program of history, we'll be able to get some idea of what of the, some of the things that we, the program in which can help to narrow the gap between uh, the developed and developing countries. And uh, as the establishment was, uh, as history was as established in 2008, uh, after the agreement between the government of Malaysia and uh, UNESCO, the objective is as shown here, basically to address the problem of developing countries and to develop networking. And also the focus area basically is on science policy, science education, technopreneurship development. And, uh, and if you look at the membership, I'm looking from mystic from the point of uh, membership of the board itself. We have a governing board of 18 members at the moment, and the distribution of this is uh, six are from the OIC countries, and then five from developed countries, and nine from developed countries. So it's quite a balance. And the idea of having this uh, kind of strategy is to ensure that uh, we learn from each other what is the best for, for us, and also to get the best from the uh, uh, the, the networking that we have with the agency, organization, or nodal centers, uh, they are in place with, with, the, with developing countries. And we have an advisory board, which has 20 members, 24 members at the moment. Seven are from OIC countries, organization, nine from developed countries, and eight from developing countries. Again, you have uh, some sort of a quite equitable distribution, about 50 percent each. And again, as I mentioned, I want to emphasize that we do collab collaborative programs, and that through collaborative program that we have, we, we, we are able, uh, one of the objectives to actually to bridge the divide between developed and developing countries through OIC countries. 
And these are some of the programs that I, have, I will highlight that we have done in 2011. And um, uh, it includes uh, number three, for example, the maintenance uh, of infrastructures. This is done uh, again in collaboration with uh, the uh, Engineering Staff College of India. And because they have the, the very good module for training the engineers on maintenance of infrastructures. And um, we are also working with ESQUA. This is the new established um, Organization of Economic and Social Commission for West Asia. And um, if you look at number six, this is uh, the one that I want to highlight. is the ISTIC SSCO UNESCO Training Workshop on Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy. This is done uh, in Kuala Lumpur in the month of June. And uh, what we do here normally, we invite uh, most of the participants from the developing countries. And it, again, as I mentioned, this is the course financed by the Malaysian government. And, uh, but the expertise or the experts that, uh, that we invite in terms of uh, faculty or lectures or sharing of experiences, it can, be for, it can be both from developing countries as well as from developed countries. So that again, through that conduit or mechanism, we, we have the sharing uh, of experiences. Again, um, you look at the, um, uh, this is again on education. So on education, this is what we have done, and I think IPSC was one of those that was uh, promoted uh, earlier by uh, Professor Kiri, and we have done something in this area. And uh, then, of course, the last uh, number 10, as usual, is the training workshop on technopreneurship for South countries. This is done with the University of Science Malaysia, U Science, they call it a unit that actually commercialized all the uh, research pr product or research in invention innovation that has been developed by the, by the university. This is a very successful model and we are sharing this with most of the developing countries. And number 12, this is with the KISTEP. This is the Korean Institute of Science, Technology and Evaluation Policy, which is based in Korea. And we learn from the Korean experience how they have gone from developing country to a developed country in a matter of 20 years. So we are having this for high-level policy makers. Again, we are learning from, uh, from them on how they achieve this success. Now, you look at the map here. The, uh, in terms of multilateral partners, we have 32 now. It still has established that. And 18 are from developing countries, and 14 are from developing countries. So in a nutshell, Mr. Chairman, I think the in conclusion that um, we promote um, bilateral or multilateral um, uh, programs between uh, us and developed countries. And through that mechanism, uh, we encourage, I think, uh, this is a model in which I think all uh, academies in our OIC countries can, can formulate or follow. And if you have one, I think you should enhance that. If you have not, probably we can do that. And also we want to promote the South-South cooperation in the various areas through our collaboration. So we can learn from the developed countries and we can learn also from those countries that are more developed in the South in terms of sharing some of the success stories. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Samsudin, for your comprehensive uh, description. Uh, last but not least, let me invite Dr. Rudiger Klein, the Executive Director of ALIA, for his uh, remarks. Thank you very much, Chair. Excellencies, esteemed fellows, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. I come here towards the end of this session, towards the end of this conference, just before its high point with the final declaration, with the greetings of our members. ALEA is the umbrella organization of the National Academies of Sciences and Humanities in Europe. And we bring you for your happy birthdays and many returns the greetings of those national academies. I must confess the organizers and the chairs have done an excellent job for me to feel very much at home here. Both the Albanian Academy of Sciences, the Russian Academy of Sciences are among our members. We found many colleagues here from Bosnia and Herzegovina and Turkey, an academy you just heard it 
who has before, that has befallen a rather sad fate, and we are struggling in our exchanges with the president and the prime minister um, to find a solution to this fairly intractable problem. You've made us feel at home here, which also goes to say, and I hope you will agree with that, that an association of academies that brings together those countries cannot be called an association of academies of the West. First and foremost, it is an, an association of academies of sciences. With this overlap of members and with a shared interest in science and the promotion of science for the benefit of our societies, I would like to take issue with the subtitle chosen for this conference, Building Bridges. Let's assume we build those bridges and we are successful in building those bridges and engineering feet. Let's assume we walk from, bo from both sides to the middle of that bridge. Let's assume we shake hands. And what's next? We jump together? Probably not. We continue in our opposite directions, each reaching the opposite end. Doesn't make much sense. One takes the other one by the hand, and whichever direction they choose, they walk jointly to one side and build, following the example of uh, Farah Gulbaz earlier uh, in the conference, build a new infrastructure to one end of the valley. Doesn't strike me as particularly wise. So perhaps we should think about that bridge, that building of bridges, in the way scientists think about the next step they wish to take. Imagination is needed, creativity is needed, thinking the unthinkable is needed, building a bridge out of a bridge. And what that really requires is working together and sharing, joining, combining, mixing those imaginations, ideas about a different way of going forward. Not on this side, not on that side, not just meeting and remaining stationary, but moving ahead, moving beyond uh, a point that has revealed itself as perhaps stationary. Stationary is not the word that I would uh, use when describing the talks that I heard here in the last couple of days. In fact, it was a fairly humbling experience um, to be privileged enough to share with you in the visions, the grand visions for a new future, the possibilities that you uh, considered, as much as the insights into the glorious past of this region and its its scientific endeavors. If we look forward boldly, we sometimes perhaps forget that small steps are needed. Not that, steps, not that one step that would lead us to jumping off the bridge, but the small steps that tentatively allow us to move along that other imaginary bridge that I suggested we should build together, a bridge towards a joint future. In the European context, um, ALEA functions as an umbrella, I mentioned it, of the National Academies of Sciences and Humanities. Um, I would like to stress that second part and again reiterate how very much at home I feel here on this panel because also the first speaker from the Russian Academy of Sciences, you remember one of the earlier slides, brought together in his long list of crises, societal crises, cultural crises, the languages, of course the crises uh, that we've been talking about most of the time in these two days and others. Our association of academies is very straightforward in speaking about science, nauk, science, wissenschaft, alim, uh, as in encompassing all the sciences, including the social sciences, including the human sciences, including the legal sciences, and of course the applied sciences and engineering. What is the role of such an association in the European context? In Europe we have numerous science organizations. They deal with funding, uh, they deal with the organization of uh, the universities, they deal with quality assurance. You remember some of the remarks of His Highness. Uh, earlier in, on the first day. Our role alongside with the role of national academies uh, in the 
national context and the global association of the academies IAP in the global context is about advising government at arm's length. A little bit along the lines um, that uh, Michael Clegg uh, suggested as the gold standard for the US. Now, as you know, Europe does not really have a government yet. Uh, and having a feeble administration, that particular government of Europe, the European Commission, and its legislative body, the European Parliament, tend to prefer appointing their own little commissions to give them advice, often the kind of advice they wanted to hear in the first place. This is not the game that the academies should play. This is not the game the academies will play, and the Turkish example shows what happens when an academy decides not uh, to play along those rules that are set or, and, and imposed by governments. What we are trying to do is not to influence directly policy at the level of the European government, if that's what we want to call it, but to think, reflect with policymakers, with industry, but especially among the scientists on the framework conditions that allow us to do science well, better, in a forward-looking fashion in Europe. That this inevitably ends up with uh, advice and elements of guidance for policymakers and politicians indeed, um, you will not find surprising. Um, let me give you a short list of the areas of intervention uh, in which we have been present in the last few years, uh, only then to conclude with uh, four invitations that I would like to extend to you, having been um, privileged enough to be amongst you here in Doha today. The areas you see them are not di directed at specific science fields that we try to support, that we try to fund, that we try to uh, gather um, uh, financing for. Rather, I'm repeating myself, they concern the way science can work better. Now, Yves Carré told us in his inspiring remarks about science education that the profession of the scientist is essentially one of turning modesty into a full-time activity. Modesty means also self-criticism. Self-criticism means being aware of the feebleness of human nature, humans that we remain also as scientists, and therefore the necessity to create for ourselves as scientists rules that allow us to be seen as operating in an honest, and in a straightforward fashion, also by those who are not experts. Society, those for whom we work and those who ultimately fund our work. This is why the issue of ethics stands very high on our agenda. This is why the issue of exchanges between the public and private sector, with very different pressures being brought to bear on science and scientists, stands high on the agenda. Intellectual property rights have been mentioned a great deal during day one of the conference and has been, have been disappearing a little bit as we moved into the visionary part, especially of the earlier part of the afternoon session today. Yet, I believe, here is one of the cruxes uh, that we need to uh, resolve as we move into the future. How do we assess what is good science, what is excellent science, and how do we explain this to a non-scientific um, audience? Evaluation is one of the topics, and I need not say anything more about inquiry-based science education, because you cannot expect a more, um, a more, uh, a warmer account of what it is really all about than what you have uh, heard from Yves Carré. Those four are topics, if you like, that we discuss in a continuous fashion. They come up time and again in various constellations. And we discuss them at European level, but also at national level, institutional level. Then there are specific targeted interventions. Um, one of you mentioned uh, the necessity of data sharing and finding structures, creating structures in which that sharing is a becomes a possibility, indeed a routine. Research infrastructures is one of the topics we are also talking about uh, with the European Commission, with the national governments, and occasionally also across the Atlantic with colleagues in, in the US, more frequently uh, as we look south and east. 
It may not surprise you after my introductory remarks that indeed social sciences and humanities are among the topics that we would like to bring to the attention also of the policymakers in their potential contributions to resolving what are, after all, societal grand challenges. Um, we heard uh, some excellent um, experiences, again, from the US, but also from elsewhere about support for young scientists, and I would like to uh, highlight here the experience that the academies have made um, in Europe, but also in countries like Sudan or in Pakistan. Look at the poster outside with the establishment of young academies as a way of bringing the next generation of science leaders in contact with the next generation of business leaders, of leaders in politics, uh, and uh, in some countries also, and Montenegro is an example, for example, also with the arts. I start with my invitations and consider this as a, a request, a hope on our part um, to involve colleagues from just across the water, just across the water for us is essentially the Mediterranean, and just across the mountains, which are, is the Levantine mountain range, and that therefore refers to the um, Arab Peninsula, and just across um, half a continent, and that is the remainder of the, of the Muslim world uh, with whom most of our academies have already privileged relations. Consider it therefore as an invitation um, to reflect with us on a number of core topics. We heard about the desire, the investments, ultimately also the pressure that is being exercised on scientific communities um, in the Islamic countries, but not only, also far beyond, with regard to um, in increased scientific production, improve more and better. This pressure risks having a downside. The temptation may be so great that people cannot resist the urge to cut here and there a corner. Yeah. The likelihood that um, we end up with scandal stories about science should not be underestimated. Hence the emphasis that the academies, if you like, as the conscience of science, places on integrity, on research integrity. You heard about the European Code for Research Integrity. We are now um, working with about 150 organizations in Europe, research councils, ministries, universities, but also businesses to implement this code. Um, IAP and IIC will launch a global initiative to translate this even further. ICSU was a, a co-sponsor of the global conference on scientific integrity where the code was presented. Um, the invitation to you is to be more active in this particular in this particular field because your countries will be the ones that the world is waiting for to emerge as scientific powerhouses. It will happen and when it happens, the young scientists have to be prepared to play by, by the rules. And it is the responsibility in our belief of the academies to instill those rules. An issue is plagiarism and here a very specific invitation is to a workshop conceptual and practical on the notion of plagiarism that we will hold at the end of December, in mid-December in Amsterdam. Palestine was one of the um, absentee um, uh, owners of the notion of, a, of an academy in the, in the, uh, in the Muslim countries, um, which personally surprised me a little bit. It was referred to every now and again in some of the presentations. I would like to refer very briefly um, to the program we have set up to support higher education and research in Palestine in conjunction with UNESCO. And I would very much appeal to all of you um, to think about whether here we could not uh, aim at a, a joint uh, activity. The deans of the leading universities are involved. The progr teaching programs, distance and mentoring uh, are in place. But in our view, it is not good enough that we have a a privileged West Palestine relationship alone. Um, the wider environment, the wider Arabic and Muslim environment needs to be involved. Two last points and I'm done. Um, I am belaboring this point because I know that um, the room uh, is largely filled with uh, scientists. 
um, I am belaboring the point of including social science and humanities approaches into the study of the grand challenges, which are grand challenges. In Europe, we are trying to do this um, thanks to an initiative uh, by one of our member academies that has brought along now around about 25 academies. And we are trying to integrate into the thinking about energy choices, about food choices, about health choices, the, the insights that um, those disciplines um, can offer. We also believe that there are grand challenges out there that go beyond uh, what can even be imagined as a technical fix. That includes education, that includes environmental research, that includes mathematical modeling, that includes urban studies, and last not least, important for this particular conference, the intercultural dialogue. The invitation to you is to think in IAS that wants itself an organization where you reflect on models for society, models for individual behavior, and on science to join this debate. The invitation uh, is one that even without us mentioning has already been picked up in Malaysia where I understand uh, an, acad an academy for the social sciences is about to be launched. Finally, and this is the last slide, um, I will not go with you over the various efforts that have been made in the US and France in terms of supporting inquiry-based science education. You heard it um, better um, from Yves Carré than anyone else can tell the story. What I would like to bring to your attention, however, is the upcoming uh, conference that we are organizing uh, with uh, IAP and the um, delegation of the Finnish Academies of Sciences in Helsinki in 2012 because um, we had been thinking about a regional focus um, on um, the Middle East, and we would therefore extend an invitation uh, to those of you who feel passionately about this particular topic um, to contact us, uh, contact the IIP Secretariat to see and, and explore possibilities for joining this uh, particular debate. There's a very specific purpose here. The purpose is that science education can be moved on the agenda of what is the Union for the Mediterranean, which is essentially the European collaboration program uh, with the Middle East, and as part of the EU-African Union um, dialogue. You're most welcome to join us on this occasion and give your imprint to this particular effort. I wish to thank you very much for the attention uh, that you've given me, for the privilege of being amongst you, and the chairs for their endless patience. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Klein. Thank you very much. Uh, we have come to the end of our session, and we have listened very carefully to the eight presentation. I now turn to my colleague, uh, Professor Mohammad Hassan, the discussion, would like to say a few words. Mohammed, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zach. Um, I think you all agree with me that uh, the eight presentations you heard, first session and the second session, were all superb presentations. Um, it will be very hard to summarize uh, each one of them, but I would really like just to reflect on a number of issues. I think, uh, of course, the, the title of this, these two sessions uh, is the role of academies, role of academies in bridging, in building bridges through science and technology. And uh, by way of summarizing, I can think of four types of bridges. Uh, the first one, the very familiar one, is uh, building bridges across countries and nations, and especially those that have strained political relationship. Uh, this is what um, is called nowadays science diplomacy or soft diplomacy. And there are numerous examples, both bilateral examples and multilateral examples. And one of the best bilateral example that I heard of uh, is the example of building bridges with the United States National Academy of Sciences and Iran. Michael Clegg did not talk about that, uh, but in my view, this is really one of the best examples of science diplomacy or soft diplomacy. 
And as a result of this type of collaboration, a large number of scientists from Iran and their counterparts from the United States have really managed, managed to publish joint papers in peer-reviewed journals, and a good number of these papers. And maybe Mike, later on during the discussion, might like to talk a bit more about this. On the multilateral side, I can give you a, a good example of a, an activity that was held in Trieste, uh, organized by IAP, uh, TWAS, and uh, also the ICTP. And um, th that was actually an initiative that was proposed to us by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy. Uh, if you remember a few years ago, Italy hosted the meeting of ministers of foreign affairs of the G8 plus five. Uh, so we agreed that we should invite, uh, take that occasion, a very important occasion, and invite the presidents of academies in Afghanistan and the neighboring countries of Afghanistan. That is, um, Iran, uh, uh, Pakistan, uh, India, and a number of other countries in Central Asia. And it was an extremely useful exercise. The meeting was actually opened by the ministers of foreign affairs of India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So it was really high profile from the political side. And it was um, an effort to try to promote collaboration in science and technology among these countries that normally don't talk to each other that much. Uh, and if you like more information about, about it, it is available with the IAP or to us. I mentioned ICTP, and I think ICTP itself is an excellent example of an institution of excellence that from the start was focusing on science diplomacy and promoting collaboration between countries where scientists do not really meet each other or do not talk to each other that often. And uh, I remember from my own area, the uh, nuclear fusion that was discussed actually uh, earlier uh, today, uh, you know, nuclear fusion was classified research up to the year 56, 1956. And then the physicists found out, physicists everywhere in the world, that this is just too difficult a problem to be tackled with scientists in a particular nation. They have to open up and collaborate. And the ICTP organized the first meeting ever, international meeting on fusion research held in Trieste in 1964. And participants, eminent scientists from the Soviet Union, from the United States, from Europe, came to discuss, first of all, to talk about the results and the recent research and to discuss collaboration. So that center, again, is an important example of multilateral uh, uh, science diplomacy efforts. Um, the second um, area where I feel is very important when you talk about building bridges um, is something that relates to building bridges not only across nations, but across disciplines and multi-stakeholder communities. And I can give you a good example, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Klein uh, highlighted it, and that is an effort, a joint effort between the World Economic Forum and the Inter-Academy Panel, the IAP. And uh, as many of you might know, the World Economic Forum organizes every year a meeting, uh, in addition to the meeting in Davos, a meeting in China in September, where they bring a good number of uh, young champions and young leaders from various sectors, uh, from business, from finance, from industry, from politics also. And about five years ago, we agreed with the World Economic Forum that we should bring every year to the same forum a group of highly talented young scientists under the age of 40, 45, selected by academies of science or nominated by academies of science and selected on the basis of merit to come and attend this event with the other young champions and interact with them and see if they can forge linkages and collaboration. So in my view, this again is a good example where academies of science uh, have really helped to build bridges across disciplines and multi-stakeholder communities. The third example is building bridges 
with policy and decision makers. And this is, of course, very well known that this is a fundamental uh, objective and strategy of any academy, and that is how to provide this evidence-based and, and credible advice to governments on very critical issues. And a good number of examples were given by uh, Peter Drenz and Shamshir Ali also, and that is in the form of issuing statements. Uh, these are short statements on very, very critical and important issues that not only the governments and the decision makers would like to, to see the views of the best scientists in the country or region, but also the general public. Issues like evolution, cloning, stem cell, um, and then acidification, ocean acidification, a host of issues that I think are very important for uh, the entire world to know about uh, or to know the views of the best scientists um, uh, on these on this very critical and important issues. And the fourth one, uh, which is, uh, I don't think it was talked about that much here, is building bridges across society at large. I think academies of science also has this very important role, how to link up with the societies at large. And of course, science education is a very important one, especially the inquiry-based science education. Uh, but I also say, uh, recommend very strongly that academies of science, especially in the developing world, should be more and more involved in helping their nations uh, to build science centers and science museums. Uh, these are very, very important institutions that can provide uh, good information about science and technology and promote the public understanding of science. And I think this is very important. So these are the four uh, areas that I felt are, are, are important. But let me make just a general observation. Uh, building bridges through science and technology can only, can only be strong if science is strong on both sides of the bridge. You cannot have science strong on one side and very weak on the other, and you try to create a bridge that is strong. Otherwise, uh, Professor Badran, the bridge will be very shaky and you may fall, fall off when you try to cross it. Uh, so this is really important. And that's why I think all the issues that we talked about yesterday and today related to capacity building in science and technology, related to centers of excellence, uh, related to centers, to universities of excellence, all the areas that promote capacity building, especially in the OIC countries, I think are very important and very crucial if we are to build strong bridges with other nations outside the OIC uh, countries. We also need strong and active academies of science. Uh, and we want these academies to play, if we want these academies to play an important role in building bridges through science and technology. We have 57 OIC countries, about 25 of them have academies. Uh, but I can tell you that the majority of them are extremely weak and they need to be strengthened. Uh, so we have also a large number of countries in the OIC region that do not have academies. So an effort, and a special effort, must be made to strengthen the existing academies and also to initiate the establishment of new academies. And that's why uh, I would like to conclude by this. IAS, the Islamic World Academy of Sciences, role in all this, in all what I have said, is extremely critical because it's the only place that can identify the best scientists from all the OIC countries. Since the majority of them do not have academies, and those who have academies are really very weak in their structure. And that's why I call upon everybody, especially our policy makers and decision makers in OIC countries, to really, really take this into account. Or uh, IAS must be strengthened, and must be strengthened more and more, so that it can play an important role in building these bridges across other nations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mohammed, for your very excellent uh, summary and conclusion. I'm tempted to open the floor for intervention, but I think we have gone through the uh, time of the closing session. Uh, why don't you join me now in thanking the uh, panel here. And uh, thank you very much. And I'll just take the liberty of presenting those plot to them, yeah? Okay. Maybe you have to call them. Thank you, Professor Zachary. 
Before you run away, Professor Hassan, we'd like to honor you with the shield of the Islamic World Academy of Sciences. Please, Professor Muhammad Hassan, ladies and gentlemen, IAP co-chair. <laughs> Uh, Professor Shamsuddin Tugiman, Secretary General of the Academy of Sciences Malaysia. Uh, Professor Robert Nugmatullin of the Russian Academy of Sciences. <laughs> Professor Bakiraj, the President of the Albanian Academy of Sciences. And last but not least, Dr. Rudiga Klein, the Executive Director of Aliyah. And this last one. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the IS Secretariat has uh, prepared a draft declaration that has been circulated to uh, a number of IS fellows and other participants. Uh, so we have a draft closing statement. We have a draft declaration ready. Um, you will have a hard copy within a few minutes. Can I have the recommendations of Professor Hassan, please, from the last session? Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, as is customary at uh, the closing session of the IAS conference, um, I'll very quickly go through the declaration. And uh, please, anybody with suggestions, amendments, corrections, to write them down on the draft with his name and give them to one of my assistants or to me once I'm done so that we incorporate all the proposals into the final version of the declaration, which we will circulate to you all then to look at. The Islamic World Academy of Sciences 2011 Doha Declaration. This is on the title of the Islamic World and the West, Rebuilding Bridges Through Science and Technology, adopted to be adopted at Doha, Qatar, on the 23rd twenty third of October 2011, preamble. The Islamic world stretches from Indonesia in the east to the Atlantic Ocean in the west and from the Volga, Bulgaria in Russia in the north to the, to the source I can't see anybody, by the way, so if I miss you, forgive me, because the light is in my eye and it's very few people that I can see. For centuries, it is the air, it's an area of historical importance as it's the birthplace of the world's three Abrahamic religions. For centuries, the region was a hub of groundbreaking science. Today, it is of contemporary strategic importance owing to its location and its wealth of natural resources. Over the last decade, like the rest of the world, the region has witnessed political upheaval, military conflict, natural disaster, as well as economic boom and bust. Notwithstanding these difficulties, the same period also witnessed renewed interest by many, many OIC countries in reinvigorating science and technology, s and and higher education with the launch of a number of top-down initiatives to support education and research, including in Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Jordan. Other countries have also approved plans to allocate more resources to research and development. 
During 2011, a tsunami of political events swept through the Arab region of the Islamic world and aftershocks are being felt all over the world. People no longer tolerate the inability of regimes to deliver at the political level and at the policies level. The failure of many governments in the developing world to achieve acceptable levels of socioeconomic advancement or development has been an aggravating factor. Islam is not at all the problem facing scientific, scientific achievement in the Islamic world today. On the contrary, Islam has been and can be the driving force behind an all-encompassing renaissance in science, technology, and innovation for a better tomorrow for Muslims and humanity. Rather, the low level of achievement results from the cumulative effect of multiple factors and not from a single dominant cause. Governance in many OIC countries is in a state of turmoil. Many OIC polities are torn between upholding national security as they perceive it and maintaining social order on the one hand and generally adopting good governance practices on the other. These practices include upholding, promoting democracy. These practices include promoting democracy and the rule of law, promulgating accountability and combating corruption. Five, science and technology and innovation, STI, still represent the primary force behind the advancement of human civilization. Productivity gains and the achievements of humankind have been derived chiefly from innovation based on scientific exploration, technological and engineering innovation, as well as extensive application of S&T. Despite political and economic uncertainties, OIC states have no choice but to stimulate science, technology, and innovation together with the education sector, if only to overcome some lingering problems like food, water, and energy insecurity. OIC countries can, can also learn from the remarkable socioeconomic progress of countries such as Brazil, China, India, Malaysia, and Mexico, due in part to s &T. Because the quest for knowledge is a pillar of the Islamic code of belief, and knowledge and its pursuit have assumed augmented importance in an increasingly knowledge-driven world economy, OIC countries must commit themselves to becoming a community that values knowledge, one that is competent in utilizing science, technology, and innovation to enhance its socioeconomic well-being. Thus, the participants in the 18th IAS conference note with concern that there are lingering political problems that exist in the Islamic world today, problems that hinder socioeconomic advancement and cripple humanity's quest to try to attain a better common future. Despite a mushrooming in information and media channels, a certain information divide still exists between the Islamic world and the West that hinders cooperation at the political level and at and the more down-to-earth policies level. That hinders cooperation at the political level and the more down-to-earth policies level, including higher education and science and technology. The rule of law has been described as a yardstick of as important as the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, and as being the key to achieving all of these goals. Strengthening the rule of law and achieving fair and predictable rule of law lays the foundation for safer societies that are able to offer their citizens. There's something missing here. I, I will check it a little bit. Better societies for their citizens. There exist significant obstacles to science, technology in OIC countries, including inter alia, lack of comprehensive science, technology, and innovation policies, and strategies emanating therefrom. The objective of such policies should be, should be to realize some level of national prosperity, food, 
water and energy security as well as national self-fulfillment. The dearth or inadequacy of resources, infrastructure and institutions, gender imbalance in science and technology, shortage of tra trained personnel, prohibitive costs of acquiring knowledge and technology and barriers to the transfer of knowledge, personnel and technologies from developed to developing countries and also are also obstacles of significant impact. Inter-OIC collaboration over the last three decades has at best been a modest success. OIC decision makers have to come have to come up with more innovative ways to make cooperation less bureaucratic and more effective. This is particularly true in problems that are transboundary in nature, such as water, energy, health, and food security. And appeal to the decision makers in OIC countries to implement specific actions at the national and international levels, including inter alia, engender commitment to science, technology, and innovation at the highest political level, sizably increase R&D expenditure, and promote the central ro role of the university as an originator of scientific output. Investment in science and technology education has been a critical source of economic transformation. Such investment should be part of a larger framework to build capacities in, in STI worldwide. Improvements in higher education needs to be accompanied by growth in economic opportunities so that graduates can apply their acquired capabilities. Promote and enhance scientific and technological cooperation among developing and OIC countries. The IAS also calls for the exchange of scientific experiences and of technologies with a view to intensifying cooperation and delivering real benefits among developing countries, especially involving countries that have developed significant expertise in science and technology policy development, science and technology infrastructure, biotechnology, nanotechnology, and information technology. Three, recognize that prompt action is required to ensure that these, that Young scientists cultivate a sense of hope and purpose so that they may contribute to shaping a sustainable future. Future generations in OIC countries must be educated and not indoctrinated. They must learn and not be taught to work hard to identify role models in science and life that they can emulate and learn to work together as teams rather than as individuals. A thorough review of our education system in the OIC is required to ensure that generations of tomorrow are equipped with the tools that enable them to face the challenges of tomorrow. Moreover, our community leaders are invited to support and mentor the youth and early career scientists. Four, Engage more female scientists in raising the right questions and searching for sound answers if the sizable women science community of the OIC is to contribute to the development of the Ummah. Even in developed countries today, the upper levels of or the occupational ladder in science and technology, women are underrepresented. Women graduates in science and technology count for only one-fifth of full professors in research institutions, this phenomenon has been aptly called the leaky pipeline or the glass ceiling. What is needed is an integrated approach that includes mentoring, science education, recognition, and the promulgation of best practices and appreciate that advice on science, technology, and innovation needs to reach policymakers. For this to happen, an institutional framework needs to be created 
and commitment needs to be garnered to support it. At the university level, we must integrate rather than segregate students, especially from the science and literary streams, so that all future leaders appreciate the value of science as a means of socioeconomic advancement. Advisory structures differ across countries. In many countries, science advisors report to the president or prime minister, and national science academies provide political leaders with advice. The advisory processes should be able to gauge public opinion about science, technology, and innovation. At the level of the OIC, appropriate mechanisms should be worked out by the IS to provide advice to OIC heads of state, parliamentarians, and other decision makers. Six, historians of science have propagated a number of theories related to the rise and possible decline of Islamic science. A need to revisit this issue has ascended not only to highlight the contribution that the Islamic civilization has made to world civilization, but also to learn about the deep-rooted underlying reasons for this decline in order to learn from the lessons of the past and in today's tensions-ridden world, promote harmony between cultures and peoples. It is imperative that interest of the OIC science community and ultimately the public is rejuvenated in what has become known as the alternative narrative of the rise and decline of Islamic science and why has the ascent of science in the West led to industrialization and not so in the Islamic civilization. Academies of Science's roles are multifaceted and multilayered, at the heart of which lies the promotion of science and technology and the application thereof to increase knowledge, improve socioeconomic conditions in society. Academies of Science improve socioeconomic conditions in society. Academies of Sciences ought to be further involved in promoting science and the scientific endeavor and act as active advocates of science and technology as a means to overcome the array of problems that humanity faces. They must act as sovereigns of science in their catchment area, unequivocally taking the moral high ground on all issues that face humanity. It is imperative that OIC countries establish national academies of sciences or where such entities exist, strengthen them. Furthermore, the Islamic World Academy of Sciences extends its appreciation to His Highness the Amir of the State of Qatar and His Excellency the Prime Minister for hosting the conference, to the Permanent Committee for Organizing Conferences of the Qatari Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Doha International Center on Interfaith Dialogue the Islamic Development Bank, Comstec, OPEC Fund for International Development, Perdana Leadership Foundation, and the Jordan Phosphate Mines Company for generously sponsoring this international scientific congregation. Thank you very much. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We now have uh, our president, president of the Islamic World Academy of Sciences, and the co-chair, His Excellency, Mr. Muhammad Abdullah Rumaihi, the assistant minister of foreign affairs of the state of Qatar and co-patron of this conference. Uh, I have received the comments of many of you, I would kindly request all of you who have seen the draft and have further comments on the 2011 Doha Declaration to very kindly give the comments to me or to one of my three assistants here so that tonight we can sit down 
um, and review all the annotations that you've proposed and produce the final version of the declaration, the Doha Declaration of 2011. May I now invite Professor Majali to say a few words. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Al-Akh al-Aziz. Sa'adat al-Sayyid Muhammad Abdullah al-Rumahi. Musa'ad wazir al-Kharijiyya al-Qatari li shu'un al-Mutaba'a. Excellences, distinguished guests, eminent fellows of the IAS, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We have had a long day today as well as was yesterday. So I am not going to have a long speech, but I have to take this minute to thank you all for coming, for joining this conference, and especially my thanks go to our distinguished guests from the East and West who joined us, who attended the conference as hard as any member of the Council of the, uh, of the IAS have done we shared with them all their ideas. They gave us a lot of them. They are deep and good in number as well. So quality and quantity was at its peak. So we are very grateful for them and we hope this relation will continue for the future to make sure that we are binding ourselves together as academies of science. As I said, we gather this evening after two days journey around political issues, policies, science, and the scientific endeavor. We have heard some outstanding lectures about our world about science and science academies. Perhaps we have not addressed all our questions, but you know that we tried our best to, to make your stay pleasant, informative, and interesting. We hope that you would safely make your way back to your countries with fond memories of Qatar, the host, the general host, which has not only materialistically by hosting the rooms and the food and the uh, every uh, way in administration and typing and computers and, 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 but the warmth which we have is, is tremendous. I am sure all of us will carry the memories with them. And thank you. And thank you very much. Safe journey. And God bless you all. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can I invite uh, his Excellency Mr. Muhammad Abdullah Rmehi to say a few words in conclusion of this conference. Assalamu alaikum. I can't at all conclude what His Excellency uh, Mr. Al Majali, he just closed this uh, ceremony. What I can say on behalf of the host country. Um, 
I would like to say it in Arabic, you know, here we have rules and we have to respect the rule and this, these rules in the government. Bismillah uh, ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Shukran lakum jami'an. Awad an uhayyikum wa uabbir lakum an kulli i'tizazina bikum wa bihudurikum ila madinat al-Dawha. Wa kunna natamanna an tuqimu ma'ana wa baynana fatratan atwal hatta nata'arraf alaykum wa nata'arraf ala ulumikum wa nas'ad bima tamlukun من ثروة كبيرة تنقصنا في عالمنا الإسلامي إننا في قطر نفخر بكم وبعملكم ونرجو منكم ومن إخواننا في أكاديمية العالم الإسلامي للعلوم أن يستمروا في عملهم الذي نحترمه ونقدره عاليا وإنني أدعو دولة الرئيس إلى الاستمرار وبالنسبة لنا في بلدكم قطر فإننا على استعداد لعقد هذا المؤتمر في أي سنة وفي أي وقت تريدون شكرا لكم وأتمنى لكم إن شاء الله عودا حميدا إلى دياركم وإلى أهليكم جميعا شكرا Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes the proceedings of uh, this World Wilden Conference of the IAS. Um, we will leave in uh, 20 minutes. I think the buses should be ready in 20 minutes by the front door of the reception to a local tour.